What's happening? What's happening, y'all? How's it going? Uh, everyone. Doing great. Doing great. How is everybody out there? Great. Beautiful day out here. Awesome. Yes, sir. Hi, Belle. Awesome. Well, cool. Well, thank you guys very much for joining us today for Bug Nerds, where we've got our star entomologist, which is Kara Beauchamp. So, is that how you pronounce your last name? Uh, Siri says Beecham. Uh, I say Beauchamp. Beauchamp. It's actually pronounced Beauchamp. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> However there. you want to call it. Whatever you want to call it. There it is. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, Key to Life Supply is proud to announce our partnership with Arbico Organics for beneficial bugs and all sorts of critters. And we're going to go into here in a little bit some videos on my application in my garden. But Kara, start it up. What's up? What are we going to be talking about today? What do you have planned for us? Yeah, so... Uh... Um, I want to know kind of what everyone is dealing with right now so I can address all of, you know, what brought you here and what you're looking for. Um, I have some bugs that I have to share with everybody. So we're going to have some live product on here I can talk right. about. There's a lot to cover. So um, thank you all for being here. I'll kind of give you a little bit of my background so everybody knows where I started, where I'm at, what I'm doing, all that good stuff. So. Um, I started working for Arbic Organics about six years ago, actually, and I kind of just worked my way up over time. Um, I worked at the insectary where we grew a parasitic wasp and assassin bug, which was really, really fun. So I got to learn that end of bugs and how they work and how they're parasitic and all that good stuff. Um, I then moved off to uh, their cannabis specialist because of my love for the plant so um and then i started working on farms about uh two years ago 2000 or sorry 2019 um i worked at my first grow in arizona it was an indoor facility they also had five huge uh greenhouses as well so i got to then practice putting my bugs out in an actual setting and that's where uh, you know my knowledge and experience has brought me to you know obviously now um, and then last season, I worked in Humboldt, which was obviously all outdoor growing and um, so much to learn. And, you know, it's every everybody's garden or farm or whatever you're growing, your space. Um, it, it really is about fine tuning what works best for you in your location. So that is what I want to share with you today and kind of go into detail a little. So that's my background, you know, short story of my background. Um, and I know that there are some people on the call today who are going to have some questions about anything in particular that they're dealing with. So would anyone like to talk about what they're dealing with? Maybe we could just start by going around and just seeing who's here. Um, yeah, so, a little intro. Yeah, a little intro. So, um, and I'll just read off a few people. Kyle Brogy from Key to Life. Our in-house microbiologist and growth specialist in Colorado. Welcome, Kyle. Uh, Philip Sorensen in Minnesota. Hey, Philip. There's Kate, uh, KTL CEO and founder, also in Colorado. How's it going, guys? Welcome, Kate. What up? What up? How's it going, everybody? Hey, we really appreciate you guys coming by. We want to just while you know we're on me, just wanted to say. These are all about being interactive, open community form. We want you guys bringing your stuff to the table, your questions, your concerns, your ideas, any of the fun stuff. Continue, Mike. Most of all. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Kay. Yeah, so let's see. So who else we got? We got, uh, I see uh, Chris Sherwin in New York. Welcome. Uh, Ian, how's it going? How's it going? Uh, Ian, Ian Smith, 
up from Colorado, but in New York or New Jersey right now, right? Back in Denver. Oh, back in Denver. Home. Yeah, it's hard to keep up with you, man. Gypsy. <laughs> Gypsy lifestyle. There's uh, Kyle Menarsik uh, in Ohio. Hey, Kyle. And uh, let's see, Becky Patton in Colorado. Hi. Hey. What's up? Hi. And uh, Taylor in LA. Hey, Taylor. And I see also we got Spencer Batson. I believe he's in Ohio as well. Um, hey. Londo Masterman from Bose Lightning. Hey, Londo. He's in hot and sweltering Las Vegas. You know it. Learn about the bugs. <laughs> Thank you for the education. Yeah, thank you. Glad, glad to have you here. And I'm, glad to see you. I'm also seeing uh, Soco Organics. That's Caitlin Lawrence from Pueblo, Colorado. Hey, Caitlin. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gary Sykes. How are you, Gary? I think you're in North Carolina. Is that right? Right. And fiber. And nice. Fiber farming. All right. Welcome. Welcome. And then let's see, Jenny. Hey, Jenny. Hi. How's Hi. it going? How are you? Where are you I'm, calling in from? I'm calling in from Denver. Um, I'm a GM of cultivation for Natty Rem. Aha! Uh -huh. There we go. Nice. Welcome. Awesome. Welcome. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Nice. I got to come check, come down. It's been a while since I've been to the facility. I'd love to come hang out. Key. Automation is your friend. Excellent. Let's see. Uh, okay, so uh, oh, there's Brian Carey from Florida. How you doing, Brian? Hey, how's it going, guys? Welcome. Um, let's see. And uh, and I'm seeing uh, Bell from Indoor Grow Buddies in Tucson, right? Yeah. All right. Welcome, Bell. And then uh, Kittrick. Hi, Kittrick. Calling from your hey. car. <laughs> yeah, I'm in between meetings, I just had a meeting with an attorney, but I'm uh, Kit Jeffries from Rapid City, South Dakota. I actually worked with Becky down at Agron way back in the day. And, Hi, Kit. Uh, Hi. Hey, Becky. How are you doing? I'm so glad you're on this call. It's I sweet. know. Uh, you too. I moved out here to South Dakota. I'm a registered lobbyist with Dakota Cannabis Consulting, educating lawmakers on this sweet new medical marijuana program we have here in South Dakota. So. Nice. Good job. Good job. I love it. Glad to have you. Uh, let me see who else we've got. Uh, Eli. Is it Eli or Ellie? That's, that's Woody. Oh, hey, Woody. What up, Woody? Buddy. Yes, welcome to our call. And let's see if I missed anybody. Zach. Yeah. a video. No worries. Sometimes the limited fast bandwidth means uh, not much video. No problem. Yep. And then I also wanted to say we are also on live via YouTube. So all of you guys here on Zoom are are the lucky individuals who got the Zoom link and chose to be, you know, maybe a little bit of participants or ask questions or whatever it may be, feel free at any given time. Also, you guys on YouTube Live as well as Facebook Live, feel free to type into the comments or into the chat um, if you have any questions on anything that we're talking about at any point. But uh, yeah, welcome everybody. It's really good to see all of your faces. We really appreciate it. And uh, Kara, actually, uh, if you um, if, if it's not too much trouble, we actually had uh, Caitlin from SoCo chime in uh, right away with a question um, about uh, helping fight against mealy bugs. Ooh. Yeah, they're rough. Um, so with mealy bugs, we do have certain types of predators. There are some certain types of destroyers. Um, and we can go into depth about that as well. But um, if you have Really want to try spraying. Spraying is going to be ultimately going to give you a clean slate. So 
that we start incorporating biologicals. Biologicals are really there to maintain the space over a longer period of time and sustain the cell. So this is for any bug. I can use bug, use it, grub, um, beetles, you know, really have to figure out what time of the year they're you know, coming out specifically in the spring. Um, so using abdurastin, hygienic, um, with pyrethrin, those are really good general sprays for those types of insects. And doing those types of sprays prior to introducing the biologicals is really going to help you to gain better control versus introducing biologicals and hoping that they're going to eradicate your problem, which is really difficult. So a lot of ICS is, depending on your weather, depending on your climate, um, you know, a lot of these free sprays and free treatments are going to help you to gain control throughout the entire season. So it really just depends on what method you're wanting to use throughout the year. But uh, like I said, uh, you know, spraying, uh, depending on what you're growing, is what we so obviously we're talking about cannabis. Um, a lot of my clients, they spray through flower using silver bullet, like sulfur, um, using that up until about week three of flower, and then switching over to biologicals when you cannot spray, which is really, really crucial. Um, so that's just a very basic, um, you know, treatments for doing that and other types of insects as well. But also, you know, understanding what climate you are in, humidity and temperatures play a big role in, in whether these bugs are going to work out for you or not as well. And also fine tuning the quantity that you're going to need, depending on, you know, the density or the level of infestation from that particular insect. Uh, so there's a lot of fine tuning that comes into play with um, pest management and organic solutions. And that's why I'm here, so I can help you determine that and to get you guys on the right path. Because every single person is going to have a different scenario. Some people are growing near corn. If you're growing near a cornfield, you're going to have an influx of aphids because that's what they're attracted to. If you're in the middle of nowhere and you're surrounded by certain types of vegetation, um, you know, you're going to be prone to different types of bugs. So it's also including treating the area where that infestation is, also treating the parameter of the building if you're growing indoors or even outdoors, if you're treating outside of the space, that's gonna help get you be over the course of the season as well. Any feedback on that? <laughs> I absolutely love it. I mean, you know, rotating, rotating biologicals and rotating sprays, I've seen the magic for myself. And, you know, it gives you kind of the flexibility to be able to, you know, target, treat certain, not only insects, but as well as sprays for individual problems that you're having in your garden. And a lot of times, if you plan accordingly, you can do it to where you're not harming large populations of bug life cycles and things like that. So I absolutely love it. I'm super excited to hear about what, you know, all these pro tips and stuff. And, and whenever you want, I can queue up some videos on some, a little bug drop that I just did as well. Yeah, we would love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Does anyone have any particular questions that I can address? Okay. I got a question. Take it away, Jenny. Um, is there is there any like biological insect that um, let's say you have to spray that would live through a certain treatment, or just no matter what, you're gonna wipe out the beneficials as well as the bad? That's um, a good question, and um, I'm really glad that you brought that up. One of my all-time favorite products on the market right now, Pure Crop One. Can you repeat that? It's pure crop one. Okay. U R E crop C R O P and then the number one. So it's an oil based product. It uses the fatty acid molecules that make up corn and soybean oil, but it particularly targets sap sucking insects, which are not beneficial predators. So it's completely safe for your beneficial. One of the only products on the market, that and 
Grand Devo is a little softer, um, not 100% guarantee that it's going to have an effect on beneficial, but those two products are one of the only ones that I am personally aware of that don't cause harm to beneficials. So, and it's a really good point that you bring that up because a lot of people who have severe problems with, with uh, a pest, that's really the way to go because your biologicals are going to sustain the space. They're going to start proliferating. They're going to start colonizing. And when you're also using sprays that are compatible with them, you have two lines of defense. You know, you're using a spray that's going to work really well with them. You're going to also have effect on, you know, the pest. It's also a fungicide and a miticide. So um, you're getting multiple benefits from that product in conjunction with allowing your your predators to colonize in that space without harming them. So yes, I would say that there's ways around that. Um, the technology is getting there. It's definitely getting there over time, but Purecock came out, you know, a few years ago and people will call me just to tell me, thank you so much for recommending this product. It works out so well. And they use it in conjunction with predators. And once they get over that hump of dealing with a heavy level of infestation, then you're not going to have to use the spray and you can really, you know, rely on your, on your bugs, which are obviously going to be the most organic way to sustain a space. And they do so well outside, um, especially because there's, you know, such a, there's a way for them to move in and out of the space and coexist. And, you know, there's definitely that possibility. So I highly, highly recommend that product. I'd also, I'm sorry, guys. I'd just like to chime in on this real quick. I've, uh, I've, I've been listening to what Kara has been saying about, uh, other products that won't take out beneficials. Uh, I use a person. I personally use a product called OG BioWar, and um, it has some strains of bacteria in it that help within the soil, uh, and it doesn't kill um, basically any other bug that's on the surface other than target insect. So. That's amazing. What's it called? OG BioWar. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the breeder Capulator uh, Mac One. He. Uh, it's actually his product. Yeah. It's called, it's called OG it's, Bio War. It's very similar to our microbes. If you look at the um, as far as like what, what's in their products, I can pull the bag right now. Um he has like very particular strains that he works with that he swears by. Um yep. my main issue that I've been dealing with for years uh, has been root aphids coming back on and off. And I use this product when I, as soon as I see them come back. I use this product with nematodes in my veg. It works really, really well. Um, looks like the active ingredients are Bacillus subtilis and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different kinds of bacteria. Um, yeah, the product's called OG BioWar. And uh, it's it's really really good. Like I use the Marone products too, like the Grand Evo and the Venerate Regalia. Yeah. Uh, but this is a really good uh, <coughs> thing to do before you introduce those. Awesome. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. There are so yeah. many products. I'm so glad that you brought that up because that's what this that's what this is all about is bringing everybody together, yep. putting in their input because. You know, I, I personally have dealt with these specific um, insecticides on and off the farm. So thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah for sure. Specific, yeah. Um, actually, I'll show you some nematodes. I have some nematodes here. These are specifically actually what you would want to use for um, root aphids. This is HB species Heteroheptias bacteriophora. And the way that they come packaged is they actually look like a powder. So, they're <coughs> so these are microscopic, non-segmented roundworms, and they're mixed up with diatomaceous earth. Um, you mix these into water, you apply them to the first couple inches of your soil, and they start colonizing and doing their thing. They're parasitic, so they use the insect, let's say it's an aphid, as a host to reproduce. So every time they're parasitizing and killing off a root aphid, they're, they're proliferating as well. So so many benefits with those as long as your soil doesn't freeze and they continue to have a food source they'll continue to thrive in the soil and that's what's so awesome about using bugs is that they continue to thrive in that space and the more and the longer you use them over time 
you know, they're just going to colonize even more in that space, which is going to give you longer term protection, which is really, really what we want, especially if you're growing organically. Yeah, biology and the soil and beneficials work so well together. Yeah, they really, really do. Yeah. Um, I have uh, some other bugs while we're, while we're doing show and tell here. Ooh. Uh, these are little teeny baby assassin bugs. I don't know if you can see them really well through my screen here. They're oh, super yeah. small. This is a generalist predator. They're an ambush uh, predator. And um, this is after they have just hatched out. So they've been sitting um, in this little container and their eggs right here. I don't know how well you can see these either, but they look like little sushi rolls. <laughs> and there's a white waxy coating on top of those eggs. And when that gets removed, you can tell that they've hatched. So, and this brings me to a point too, when you're using biological control, it is so important to check for viability before you put them out. I think that's a super common mistake um, that, you know, oh, my bugs aren't working. You know, there's a lot of reasons or ways that you may not be able to get your biologicals viable via through the mail, through FedEx, whatever reason. And it's really hot or it's super cold in the winter and you're growing inside. Um, so that's really, really important, especially I wanted to obviously touch on that. Um, but Tate, he probably has some really good videos also of like the green lace wing adults. If you want to go ahead and share those, Heck that yeah. way you can get an idea of exactly kind of what to expect when you get these beneficial insects. And then I can kind of touch on, you know, placing them as well. Cause obviously the sizing that you're going to receive through biologicals is going to determine, you know, be determined by how many plants you're going to have as well. And the density of your plants, because if you're growing, you know, row crops and you're growing 15 foot cannabis plants, you know, you're going to be prescribed something a little bit differently. So, um, and that's what I'm here for is to help determine what quantity you're going to need to have that type of success and what level of infestation you're at to gain control through sprays or through biologicals. It's very important. You know, understanding the entire system really helps to maximize and optimize the system. And then really that's what we're going for when we introduce a broad diversity of beneficial bug life or microbiological life. So I'm going to bring over my uh, photo and video here. Sorry on the front end, guys. This is totally unedited. Uh, I just want to let you guys know, I literally just shot this because I just dropped some bugs in my backyard right before this last weekend, right before I went camping. So we're going to check these out. Let me know if the audio sounds good and everything. Here we are, guys. We're dropping green lace wings. My favorite way to release green lace wings is exactly that. <coughs> Find a very dense area of canopy and coverage, like these potatoes right here, which went crazy and you can set them like so right down in there and guess what they're already flying away they're in the very middle of my garden a great place to apply them and they're gonna just do their thing they're gonna disperse themselves simpler is better guys especially when it comes to mother nature and we're gonna do the same thing with these assassin bugs these, because there are a little bit more larvae and stuff in there, we're going to put them in a really cool area where they're not going to get a bunch of irrigation water in them. They're going to be in the shade for the next three to five days so that they can hatch and thrive and grow their current and new populations as best as possible. So we're, we've got two different containers. We're going to distribute them to two different areas of the garden, just like the green lace wing. And here we are, we've got our home up above the irrigation, underneath the canopy, right where they can escape right into everything else. And they've got a little mascot. And number two, you can already see them crawling around and escaping. I'm going to put these right next to our other friends. So we've got a central point source of distribution for our fun friends here. Now we got our green lacewing eggs. 
We want to do the same thing with these as we did some of the others. Let's put them in a nice, you know, not super saturated from irrigation spot away from the sun under some shade of a canopy. So let's go find that now. So these come on these little cards and I'm actually going to come in here and I like to use sometimes my trellis to support these if I can. I just hang them right here on the trellis like so. Right in between a bunch of plants. Once again, they disperse on their own. These are just green lacewing eggs. Next, we've got another sprinkler. This is our persimilis. So we're going to sprinkle these on our areas of a garden, which are mite prone, which would be specific plant varieties, like cannabis, for example, gets more mites than Brussels sprouts, for example, or kohlrabi. So also tomatoes get more mites than Brussels or kohlrabi. So we're going to apply accordingly. And here we are with our moth egg parasites. We're going to do these the same way that we did the green lacewing eggs. We're going to hang them on a string in the canopy in a nice shady spot where they're not going to get any water on them directly. And they're not going to get any sun on them directly. So they can chill and do their own thing. Check out keytolifesupply.com for Harbor Coba. Boom. Here we are, guys. So there's one of the videos. Does anybody have any questions? on that before I maybe show one or two more. Um, I had, I yes. I had a question for Kara actually really quick. Um, so like with those with those cards and stuff like that, um, would do you think it would be better to do kind of like take it and just kind of place them all in one centralized location or would it be more beneficial to break off the individual pieces of the card and disperse them throughout the garden? Yeah, I mean the more you can distribute them throughout the space, the better distribution they're going to be able to travel. Um, green lacewing larvae, they can travel up to seven miles throughout their larval cycle, which is very impressive. So they travel really, really well. I would not be concerned about green lacewings in particular. But maybe assassin but, bugs. Yeah, but like assassin bugs, they're ambush predators. So like, I don't know if you would notice tape, but like, they actually stay where they are. Like even when they hatch from those cards, like it takes a few days for them to move because they're waiting for something to come into their path so that they can attack it and feed on it. So different bugs definitely have different ways of, you know, traveling. Um, so yes, it, it really depends on the type of insect um, that we're that we're talking about. But those cards are um, they are designed that there's perforated, you know, edges on them, their cards. So you can break that card up into 30 different pieces and put it in 30 different places in your yard. Yep. And I was on my way to camping after a 15 hour day of labor. <laughs> yeah. So either way, honestly, like green lace things are going to do their thing no matter what. I wouldn't worry so much about those. Um, but obviously something like uh, beneficial nematodes because they're microscopic, you definitely wouldn't want to centralize those. Actually, the more surface area that you cover with those, obviously, the better distribution that you're going to get. How's it going? Because they're microscopic. They really don't What's move that? super, super far, especially within a time frame. So, yes, it, it would depend. Um, another thing, too, even though he was going on his camping trip, um, applying most beneficials in the evening or right before the sun goes down is definitely going to be best recommended. Most predators are going to be nighttime feeders because they are out of sight, out of mind of other types of predators that feed throughout the day, um, like birds. So um, releasing predators during the evening is definitely going to be the best time to do your releases. So, so we have a couple of questions in, in the, the chat. Uh, Caitlin was asking, what's the difference between, in the terms of the benefits of lacewing versus ladybug? Yeah, so in my personal opinion, I like to call ladybugs high maintenance. And the reason I say that is because there is a specific climate that they prefer to live in. And it typically is a cooler climate. So a lot of the times the issues that people have with ladybugs is that they leave the garden. And one of two things I can touch on with that, ladybugs, they hibernate over the winter. 
So when people typically ship out ladybugs, we ship them with a cold pack or, you know, whatever they're in the, they're in the fridge. So when you take them out of the fridge or there's an ice pack with them, they think they're coming out of hibernation. So they leave and they go and move on. And so it's kind of hard for people to keep them in their, in their grow space. However, the larva stage of a ladybug, they feed really, really well. Um, they're going to feed on, you know, probably 20 to 50 different pests throughout the day. So they do feed really well. I would say in comparison with green lace wings, as far as their feeding habits, they're very similar. Um, however, when green lace wings turn into adults, they actually don't feed on pests. They feed on honeydew pollen and nectar. So that food source does need to be available in order for them to continue to, to thrive and sustain in a space. So using green lace wings indoors is probably not going to be the best option for you. I'd recommend like Aureus insidious, which are pirate bugs. Um, ladybugs also don't do very well inside. They always kind of hit the lights. And so um, they end up becoming slightly suicidal. So using um, green lace wings outdoors and ladybugs outdoors are definitely, you're going to get the most benefit. Um, again, using something like assassin bugs or pirate bugs indoors, you're definitely going to have better results. But green lace wings also handle um, a broader spectrum of humidity and temperatures that they can thrive in. So they're going to do best in all climates versus ladybugs are going to be a little bit more limited. And you, I've heard you say too, Kara, that you know, kind of the the, the ladybug adult um, is really more interested in breeding than it is in feeding. Um, so it, they can be kind of lazy predators, like you say, unless they're kind of in super optimal conditions um, that they're that they want to like just you know go after food and whatnot. That's correct. And that's why that larval stage is that's the hungry teenager phase where they're going to go around and eat more predators is during that larval stage versus the adult reproductive stage. Yeah, we're getting some really good questions from chat. Um, Eli Parks is asking. Why would you mix diatomaceous earth with nematodes? Diatomaceous earth is just the medium that they get mixed with. Um, it actually doesn't have any negative effect on them. It's um, it's basically the carrier. Yeah, it's just a carrier. Yeah. Okay. But and that then, does work against larger soft-bodied insects. Um, but diatomaceous earth can become ineffective when it's wet. It becomes cakey. Um, so it just I used to use diatomaceous earth on the outskirts of our of our greenhouses. I would just literally put like a foot wide like tower of <laughs> diatomaceous earth to keep the ants out. Um, but again, once it becomes cakey, it's not so effective. This is kind of related. Kit is asking: Is it beneficial to apply pests after rain, or does does rain impact either way? So that's a really good question, especially for beneficial nematodes. So because they're microscopic and if you're starting to release them before a rain, and let's say your property is on a slope, if you release them and you get a ton of rain, you're essentially going to wash out the nematode. You don't want that to happen, obviously. So sometimes after a rain, you're definitely going to get better um, results. <laughs> The nematodes if you apply them afterwards the more moist the soil is the easier it is for them to maneuver so obviously if you're in a very dry climate like if you're in arizona and it's really dry you may not have the best benefits with them because it's so dry here you constantly have to water in order to keep up with them so that the soil is porous enough for them to maneuver around well i have a quick question with a lot of what was just said um as far as like having some of these beneficials colonize um like the pirate beetles i've been seeing them in my garden from last year i've yet to put any in this year so i guess with that like how are they reproducing and how would the nematodes affect that reproduction like, are they brown? Like, do they go on the ground during the winter or? Yeah, so nematodes are essentially worms. So they're going to stay in the soil. They're not going to have any effect on pirate bugs. Um, a really good pro tip 
is to bring around lures. Um, these types of lures are like ladybug lures. You can really get them anywhere. That's going to help um, bring in these types of beneficials back into the space. We used to use them all the time in our greenhouses, and they helped so much because they're naturally everywhere. Green lacewings are everywhere. Pirate bugs are everywhere. Ladybugs are everywhere. And they're attracted to certain pheromones, which is with these lures. So if you want to naturally bring them back into the space, lures are a really good help. Um, certain types of companion planting that contain pollen, honeydew, are going to be a good um, food resource for adult green lacewings. Um, and those types of predators. Some mite predators also feed on pollen, like the Californicus. Um, so you're going to have a lot better luck of using those types of lures on an, on, obviously on an outdoor setting. If you're indoors, uh, it's going to be a little different. Uh, it, your program is going to look a little differently because your cycles are different and you obviously don't have an open space for these types of beneficials to um, be able to come in and out of the space. So uh, if you want to reestablish populations, you just have to really get more and release them on a regular basis. A lot of my people, and again, this goes back to fine tuning your program. Um, everybody is completely different. I have some people who do releases once a month. I have some people who do releases once a week or multiple times a week and they double up and triple up. Um, everybody is completely different. So you really have to monitor and take notes um, you can give your feedback to me and I can give you my feedback of what's really going to work for you in your space and how frequently you would probably need to reintroduce these into your space so that they can continue to coexist. And obviously, if they do not have a food source, it is likely that they're not going to colonize in that space. And that's why it's also important to continue to reintroduce them back into a space so that you can continue to have protection. And obviously, if there's a food source, they'll continue to, to colonize in that space because there's enough food source for their young to continue to sustain and reproduce. And that's what they are looking for. This is great. We got a lot of good activity going on in the chat right now. Uh, Jenny was asking, will mineral oil kill beneficials? Yes, it will. Um, any type of oil other than pure crop um, is going to act as a suffocant. So it's going to suffocate their air holes so they can't breathe. Um, and same thing with eggs. It's going to cause a film over those eggs so they can't continue to progress. So um, again, pure crop is pure crop. And the other one that Woody mentioned, the OG Bio War and Grand Devo, those are certain types of that pretty compatible with biological. So I would take notes for those and as well as yeah, as well as keto life bacteria or keto life microbes also has the same species as the OG Biowar plus two species of Streptomyces and two species of Trichoderma, two species of Panabacillus, and two species of Pseudomonas. So you get the same thing plus a little bit more biology. So there's so many different microbial inoculants on the market that work well with nematodes and these types of products Absolutely. for sure so i'm going to show this little video real quick on some of the other diversity of bugs key to life is proud to be in partnership with arbico organics for our bug selection it's awesome to be able to work with somebody who's tried and true in the industry and has a great reputation and very good customer service as well as good logistics behind them also a good variety of bugs is a huge bonus too we've got these assassin bugs here getting really excited these are a very effective aphid predator we've also got another aphid predator which are green lacewing adults and green lacewing eggs we want both sides of that life cycle population to get maximum population rolling we also have Californicus, beneficial spider mite predator. We also have a fungus gnat predator. We also have Persimilis spider mite predator and a triple species beneficial nematode attack to ward off against root knot nematodes. We also have moth egg parasites to keep moths away. If you guys need some help with your garden to ensure that you're going to remain bug free, hit us up at key2lifesupply.com. I think I've got some more here. This is kind of what you're going to expect when they come. You guys how these bugs
gloves are going to show up to you. So they are in a styrofoam case. You got your first layers of protection here. And look, we can already see. I'm not sure the if it's just me, but I can't your hands. Oh, yeah, that's okay. what they are. I'm getting good on These you. are amazing for helping you to get rid of aphids, aphid larvae, aphid adults, and many other types of bugs. They're one of Mother Nature's best predators, in my opinion. It does look like we lost a few during shipping, but not very many at all. As you can see, there's still so many that are completely live and active. Next, we're going to be pulling out our fungus gnat predator. I'm really excited about this one. So I've got this area in my garden. I just wanted to pause actually on this one because sometimes we always think about, you know, with beneficial bugs as well as pesticide, we usually don't think about anything other than our crop itself. Well, I've got this low area in my backyard farm that has a little bit of excess water from runoff. And this area, because of that little bit extra water, there's a little bit of fungus gnats kind of floating around. And I actually treated the ground with these fungus gnat predators. Kara, how do you say this? Stradiolalaps schematis. Yes. Oh, perfect. All right, cool. It took me so long to learn all of these names. I just want all of you to know. <laughs> That's impressive. Yeah. I always butcher the names, and I'm like, it's all good. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Stradiolalaps schematis. All right, that's a new one for me. I'm I'm used to most of the other ones, but that was definitely new. But yeah, I you know I applied these Thursday of last week. Here it is, Wednesday, less than one week later, and it was really funny because there was none left on the ground, and they were all kind of like stuck to this piece of wood, and they were all dead because this fungus gnat predator had forced them up and out of their little happy little home and onto the wood or onto the metal, and then they ended up dying. So these types of products, you know, I, I always like to say, what would you rather do? Have a chemical do something for you or thousands, 25,000 of mother nature's designed soldiers to go in and take care of what you want for you. You know what I'm saying? It's really important. Your own personal little army and they coexist. You know, it's just, I really don't know of a better way to control. Right. Mother nature knows a lot more than we do. <laughs> I always say there's no guy rolling around in the middle of the rainforest with a freaking, you know, pesticide backpack sprayer. No. <laughs> <laughs> and a feed schedule. <laughs> but. Hey, hey, Kara, I wanted to ask you, because um, the store that I, I run, you know, we sell to indoor growing supplies, what beneficial bugs would work for indoor growths other than like the pirate um and nematodes is there anything else that you would recommend absolutely i mean all of the mite predators for spider mites broad mites russet mites um, they all are going to do well indoors and outdoors um, i would say the more specific thing you're probably going to want to focus on depending on this the temperature and the humidity that is in the room if you have lower humidity, you'd want to use something like the Californicus. If you have higher humidity, you could use something like the Persimilis or Valasis. You know, there's a lot more options for higher humidity climates. Um, in the desert or NorCal, where it is a little bit hotter in the mountains, um, you do have to be a little bit careful of, obviously, what types of bugs that you're picking. But um, Californicus is great. Um, a lot of people use green lacelings indoors. Um, for one, they're cheaper and they do really, really well. They're just not going to sustain themselves in that space because they're not going to necessarily always have a food source, which is okay. Um, pirate bugs are really going to be a better option. You can use beneficial nematodes. People use them all the time. Um, actually, so me and Belle used to work at Desert Bloom together. So we were farm buddies back in the day. And um, I naturally used to find the the hypoaspis miles, the, the um, stradiolalaps, 
we naturally used to see them in our pots all the time. So they're really, really common, but you can use any of these bugs inside. It's just a matter of some of them, like an adult uh, green lacewings, they need a different type of a food source to continue to survive. So little things like that will determine how well they're going to continue to do in a space. Cool. Thank you. Absolutely. So it's all about the it's all about the house that we set up for them, right? How long do they want to hang out in the house? How much food is there for them in the house? How much water is then for them in the house? What's the weather like around the house? All of these variables influence how long they stay in your grow environment and how many generations they're going to proliferate while they're there. And these these population establishments you know, sometimes are easier for some environments versus other environments. Here in Colorado, we tend, because we've got a little bit more swinging of an environment and a little bit harsher of an environment, we have to inoculate beneficial bugs a little bit more often than, than some of the other environments that might have a little bit higher humidity and, you know, a little bit higher levels of vegetation and other things like that. So... It's really important and that's where we can help you to dial the system whether it's how the soil and how the bugs and how the plants and how the nutrients work together we can help you with that or uh whether that's outside or whether it's inside there's so many different areas of sets of dials that we have to adjust for your particular scenario yeah and also depending on the type of pest that you're working with. And I see that Sadie joined us. Thank you so much for joining us, Sadie. Um, she recently reached out to me about um, grubs and Japanese beetles that she is currently dealing with on her farm. And I briefly kind of spoke about um, the types of treatments that we can do. But with, when you're dealing with grubs, um, spring and fall are when those grubs are gonna be in the soil. So using beneficial nematodes at that time of the year is when you're going to be preventative for eliminating them from being able to pupate into adults in the summertime, which is the adult stage of a beetle, is they're going to be detrimental. They're going to cause a ton of problems. And any type of hard shell bug, like a Japanese beetle, um, they have a hard shell. So using sprays, are not always going to be super effective on them. You can use something really potent like an azadiractin or a pyrethrin blend, um, but really you're going to get your best prevention by using beneficial nematodes in the spring and in the fall. And that just copies their life cycle and you want to disrupt their life cycle over time, obviously, which will help prevent you with seasons to come. So depending on the pest you're working with or dealing with, will determine what you're treating for them at certain times, like trichogramma. Um, my rule of thumb is when you start to see caterpillar, or sorry, when you start to see moths or butterflies, that's a sign that, that they're out and they're laying eggs, and that's when you want to use trichogramma. Um, if you can identify the type of adult moth or butterfly that you're dealing with, you know, we're going to do a research on that and figure out what their life cycle is like to figure out how you can combat them throughout the entire season and to prevent them from coming back next year. So a lot of super fine tuning on depending on the bug that you're working with. So, um, so we definitely have a lot of activity going on, even a little bit of a debate in chat. And um, in particularly, there was um, people asking about indoor grows and then uh, the idea, you, you talk a little bit about uh, how lacewings and ladybugs will be a little suicidal with, uh, with some lights. And then someone said, we don't have to worry about LEDs because they're not hot enough to kill them. But could you comment at all about, are there any particular um, bugs that you recommend more for indoor than for outdoor? Yeah, and I think we touched a little bit on that with Bell as well. So, um, you know, and that's, I get that a lot too. People are like, oh, I've used ladybugs and they do really well inside. If they work for you, absolutely continue to use them. Um, I've definitely talked to people who are like, ladybugs do not do well inside. So um, it totally depends on what works for you. If they do well, absolutely, by all means, you know, don't stop doing what works for you. 
Um, but when I do hear that, I'm like, yes, I've heard of this before. So it's not to disregard that they aren't going to do well inside at all. Um, but obviously with an adult green lacewing, they do not feed on a cannabis plant. So it really depends on what you're growing. They need a specific food source like honeydew pollen or nectar to continue to thrive. So if that food source is not available in your indoor setting, they're not going to do very well. Um, assassin bugs do not need honeydew pollen or nectar to reproduce. They feed on pests. So uh, that type of bug along with pirate bugs, they also do not need honeydew pollen or nectar to survive. So one of those two or both, um, I would I suggest alternating between the two. The more species that you have in a grow space, the better off you're going to be to have coexisting relationships with different species. So um, yeah, I mean, I, it really I, depends on what you're combating. And I'd say some of the two most common especially in cannabis indoor grow facilities that I see for beneficials is your Persimilis, your Californicus, and like even your Swirskis. Those three particular things are extremely common in indoor, you know, indoor horticulture as well as nematodes. That's going to kind of be the most common that I see uh, beneficial biological pest control that's used. Yeah, and, and again, that really depends on what you're combating. So if you have spider mites, russet mites, broad mites, um, your hypoaspis, um, or sorry, your californicus, your andersoni, your swirsky, those are obviously going to go towards that target pest, and they can absolutely do well inside. So again, it just totally depends on what you're combating. Um, and nematodes, of course, hypoaspis. Um, it's just really the, the green lace wings and the adults and their food source that won't sustain them inside. Yep. Thank you. Ryan Taylor from CSU is here. Hey, Ryan. Um, and Ryan asks, do beneficial habitat plots have any positive impact? You touched on that a little bit earlier, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think through my experience, we always had better success um, using biologicals outside. And again, they can leave if they need to find another food source or they are attracting natural predators to come back into a space and companion planting. If you have a, uh, I think it's like marigold cover crops, all those things are going to help bring back in the natural uh, predators that you're going to have in your space. So absolutely, absolutely outdoors. I think in general, outdoors is just a good place to grow. It's a good place to live especially if you're a bug. So absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I also <laughs> notice. What's that, right? Uh, in my, in my cannabis grows, I was, I was companion plant and used cover cropping, um, co-planted at the same time. And, uh, basically what I've accomplished is I'm, I'm, I'm able to build the soil habitat simultaneous to, you know, production. And then I have a I have a very sustainable uh, program there. So uh, we have we have you know beneficial plots interspersed throughout the, the grow area, and we we have pests, um, but they if about there's like a seven to ten day delay. They show up, and about seven to ten days later, they just crush. So that was just kind of my experience. But I'm I'm, I'm a soil scientist, so I'm going to plug the I love it. No, and that's what it's all about. The having those diversity pieces set up into your garden hosts the cycle of life. And really, in an organic soil food web based system, that's exactly what we're going for. Cover cropping not only reintroduces nitrogen to back to the soil, but it helps to build the beneficial microorganisms on the top layer of the soil that are symbiotic relationship with that cover crop root system which helps to uptake air and oxygen and nutrients better and plus 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 so it's 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 a beautiful thing and really you know that's why or that's why we're doing these educational things is we obviously want to teach people to grow organically because it's better for the planet it's better for the people it's better for our children it's better for future generations whether it's cannabis or whether it's our food and incorporating beneficial biological controls, the 
the only real way to stay ahead of all these issues and it's it's a beautiful marriage that's for sure yeah, yeah. We, have, we have to get away from monocultures that's your problem yep yeah. So in, uh, I work for the Colorado Department of Agriculture. There's a there's a big push right now um, for agriculture to uh, sequester carbon and kind of remediate some of the larger problems that society faces. Um, the, the interesting space I think that cannabis really affords is, is two. One, if, if we see a generally recognized as safe for CBD and we see a growth of the industry on the CBD side, I really think there's the potential for rebuilding rural America with you know five and six figure jobs. Um, but but simultaneously, cannabis is really one of those plants where we really can do really good rotation, really good cover planting and co-planting, standing planting, things like that, that you know, people who are people who are growing corn just don't have the margins for. Um, so I think there's a real possibility for, for cannabis to be a leader in this space if it's organized appropriately. And, uh, and you know, I, I, being a part of the, the community for as long as I have been, you know, there's, there's enthusiasm and there's passion here. And I, I hope that, you know, at some point in time, uh, the powers that be will recognize that, you know, there's this has been going on in the cannabis industry for decades. Um, and and we can really kind of be leaders for a lot of the other industrial crops that are out there. What, uh, Thank you. Very Thank well you. said. I agree. I agree, guys. Very well and said. It's, it's not a subsidized market yet, which is the problem of the corn and garbage that's out there. So just don't make the profit margins on it. I agree. So uh, we're just uh, coming up on an hour into the call, and I've got a few more uh, things in chat. Kit, um, you know, it's funny because I was just seeing in an ag journal just today about the grasshopper infestation that's happening in in the west, uh, in the western part of the north and west, right? Um, so Kit's asking, South Dakota has a wide variety of grasshoppers. Any suggestions? I know we talked about this earlier, Kara. Yeah, so um, there's an amazing product called Nolo Bait. Um, and it's basically a bran that is covered with a type of bacteria. And off the top of my head, I don't remember what it is. Um, it's also kind of a hard product to get your hands on, but um, that's a really good product. If you can get your hands on it, um, they, they're attracted to the bait. And so once they ingest the bait, they ingest the bacteria, which will kill them. They catch a disease and they die off. Um, I know because we had it and we sold out literally within a day. We had like multiple pallets and we sold out immediately. Um, the secondary option would be using a heavy as a direct in type of spray. The hard part about that is that um, you really have to come in contact with a younger instar stage of a grasshopper in order for those types of insecticides to be very effective on them. Once they mature, they just have harder shells and they become a lot bigger and it makes it really, really difficult for them to, to control. But grasshoppers are a huge deal. And like I said, if you can get your hands on Nolo bait, that's really an exceptional product for grasshopper control. Well, the only thing they're good for here in South Dakota is fishing bait. So I'm glad we're baking into Nolo. So thank you. <laughs> And and uh, and this I think you know the other thing you said the other day, Kara, is that with hard shell creatures like Japanese beetles, grasshoppers, other things, it's pretty. It's if you're not preventing them, then it's more difficult, yeah, right, to actually treat them when they come. But that's what's important about just learning about them and understanding that, so you can preventatively combat them, you know, and um, again, that is why I'm here to help you. <laughs> and all, some some types of bugs, like some of these things that we just discussed, as well as one that I wanted to bring up, one particular bug, the earwig. The, the earwig, right? Who likes those things? Is every is everybody terrified of those? Because I'm terrified of them. They're so bad this year. They're so bad. Oh my god! I literally left over the weekend, and they ate up a bunch of like my Brussels sprout leaves super badly. Yeah, 
Yeah. Insane. My Brussels are fucked. Yeah, dude. In like three days. Perf from perfect dude, I, to totally I like. Opened, I opened up my mailbox and there was like a pile of them inside my mailbox. Yeah. Dude. It was like the creepiest, nastiest thing ever I've ever seen. That is gnarly. That is really gnarly. Well, I wanted to give you guys a pro tip on another way that you can catch these bugs because sometimes you really do have to catch them. And this is my bug trap pile that I made this last year. And we'll check out this little video real quick. What's happening, y'all? We out here in the garden taking care of earwigs and slugs. Because earwigs and slugs, unfortunately, are everywhere and they destroy every plant. And they've been attacking this plant. It's not cool. I don't like it. <laughs> so, I'm a handy dandy Sorry, guys, this is unedited. I haven't seen this video in a year. Handy dandy trap is filled with oil, it's got a strainer inside of it. Nice. It's high tech. <laughs> 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 And then the bottom cup holds the oil. And then the top cup gets the lid. And then you bury, actually. Sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, there it is. Here, here. This is a minute long. This one's the minute long one. <laughs> Taking care of earwigs. Wait, 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 wait. My apologies. Is this the right one? That's the same one. That was the same one. Here's the right one. My bad. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> unedited. Unedited. We're getting better, guys. <laughs> so I was chilling in the garden store in Oregon a couple weeks ago. I'm talking five or ten different growers came in complaining about slugs and earwigs specifically. So <laughs> I'm putting out my traps today. The traps are pretty pretty high tech. It's a cup with some holes in the bottom of it, and in a cup with with no holes in it. This holds the oil from from going into your beds. <laughs> I must have been really stoned this day. It's going to keep the irrigation water and all that crap out. It's going to suffocate the bugs and the oil. And the most important part is how do you attract them? Well, we attract them with balsamic. Basically, our bugs. <laughs> think they're getting hooked up going in <laughs> really good or something like that. And that's not what they get. They get beautiful garden by the way. The food Thanks, brother. And confused yeah. by the food, which is the balsamic. And then they get stuck and suffocated in the oil. So yeah, basically you just bury that thing down in the dirt and the amount, I wonder if I've got a picture here of how many bugs I caught. Oh, this is a good one that me and caught from me and Kyle. Oh yeah, that's always a good one. <laughs> oh man, that was my kale last year. My buddy came over and he's like, I'm stealing your kale and I'm going to use it as my loofah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, you filled a couple cups, if I'm not mistaken, right? Dude, I filled, I caught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of friggin', um, of slugs in those traps. Like they were inches thick. It was kind of gnarly how how many bugs I caught in there. It was really How's crazy. Going, everybody, beautiful morning here in the backyard. Just about to get ready to go camping. Pretty excited. However. While I'm camping, I'm not going to be worried because my garden is going to be growing and thriving and booming because of all my automated drip systems and all my healthy plants and all the assassin beneficial bugs I just put down watching my pests for me. 
So we're going to do a little mar morning tour here. We got Tegan hanging out. Hi, <laughs> dude. Love you. We got our onion. We got a carrot bed. Well, first off, we got our tomato trellis. Every single vertical in this entire tomato trellis is going to have multiple multiple clusters of tomatoes. I'm pretty excited about it. It should be pretty high yield. Three rows. It's an eight foot by 10 foot, and it's going to yield equivalently to like a hundred foot long row of tomatoes. Pretty excited. Then we've got our leaf beans, our Brussels sprouts, our Jerusalem artichoke, and our kohlrabi. Then we've got our artichoke, Jerusalem artichoke, chives, peas, and multiple varieties of peas then over here we've got a bunch of different pepper varieties 18 plants in that bed it should be pretty fun and dense here we've got more peppers we went really hard on peppers this year pretty excited then we've got this giant 20 foot long bed of cannabis absolutely beautiful got my six personal ladies out here bumping like 10 feet tall already now we got yeah, that is squash, dude. That squash and corn and peas. And you can already see all the yellow squashes in there. Going and those there. leaves are 36 inches wide. 36 and inch wide leaves. Here we are. We got the rest of the pepper bed. We got peppers. We got onions. We got chives. We got garlic. We've got all sorts of things here. Then we've got our next bed, which is is peppers again a lot of peppers we've got over 40 different varieties of pepper this year pretty excited about it but most importantly we also have this this is our tomato teepee the tomato teepee is a fun hangout area that is a part of edible landscaping getting the family excited connecting making memories in your backyard and in your garden getting up early enjoying your coffee hanging out if you guys want a tomato teepee for your backyard, let us know. We're pretty into it. We think it's going to be a good time for the family. Then we've got Squash Alley here, which I did not get done before I leave, and I'll get to do it when I get back. But, you know, I'll get to do all the finish on the trellising. Then I'm going to trellis the corn bed. Do you even have the world's hottest pepper? Yeah, we do have the world's hottest pepper. Yeah. And look at all these. More squash, more corn, more peas. And now we are to the eggplant. The eggplant is booming. If you guys see this stuff on the leaves, that's actually beneficial bugs I just sprinkled on last night. Californicus and Persimilis spider mite. Then here is my brewer irrigation setup. Very excited about this. It feeds through this one and a half inch flexi line all the way over into my system that's individually trenched for each bed. Yee! Check us out, guys. Keytolifesupply.com. Yes, it's a good time. Hey, um, we, had, we had one other question from Common Arsic about fungus gnat protection. He was asking about mosquito bits. Oh, Bacillus thuringiensis. Huh, BT. BT. Uh. <laughs> Devil micro. Yeah, so um, I love mosquito bits. I have used them forever. Um, I really do enjoy them. If you're using it um, at hydroponics, you can actually make a tea bag like you would with like a compost tea bag. You can put those bits in the tea bag and let it sit in your system. Um, like if you have a flood and drain or anything like that. So you can use that in those systems. You can also obviously use that um, in your soil. And it works really well. The water activates the bacteria off the, the corn grit. And it usually lasts about two to three weeks. Um, so you can definitely use that. Um, BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, is very specific for fungus gnats only. So it will be compatible with other types of insects that you're incorporating into your soil, such as the hypoaspis miles, uh, beneficial nematodes, road beetles. So you don't have to worry about them being harmed by another type of insecticide. So you can use both, which is absolutely amazing. 
Um, another pro tip for fungus nuts, depending obviously on the size and the scale that you're growing and where you have your fungus nut problem, if this is for home plants and it's a small pot, you can actually use sand. You can put a small layer of sand on the top of your soil and the adult fungus gnats cannot penetrate through the sand to continue to reproduce. So that helps kind of repel them from the space, obviously. So it just depends on what you're growing, but I love mosquito bits. I think that they are great in conjunction with other types of biological. And once again, you know, going back to what I talked about earlier, sometimes it's like, okay, you know, like for me, I'm not the hugest fan of using BT on my crops themselves, but like I was talking about earlier, I've got a low area in my garden that's naturally breeding and growing some uh, fungus gnats because it's got moisture sitting on mulch, you know? So that's a perfect area that even somebody like me, I could use some BT to control the fungus gnats on that spot treated area to prevent contamination and spread of the fungus gnat throughout the rest of my garden. Uh, Kyle Brogy, being a microbiologist, I heard you say the the devil's microbe. <laughs> me and Kyle, me and Kyle will rant and rave about BT for the next <laughs> week if you let us. But continue, Kyle. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to go too much into it. Um, <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, it's, um, it's one of those microbes where um, if it's if it's overused in a large amount, it has a high proclivity to kind of take over microbe areas um, and stop the spread of beneficial microbes. Um, so it's, it's, it's incredibly aggressive. Um, it does work for the things that it's used for. Um, but if, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, it, it, but basically the way Bacillus thuringiensis um, works, um, is it basically transmits as part of its metabolism, a neurotoxin. Um, and if it's used too much in crops, especially crops that you're eating, um, that neurotoxin can actually transfer itself into the plant and therefore into you. Um, so it's just, it's, it's not my, not my favorite thing to use, um, uh, just for that very sort of very reason. But, uh, yeah, I don't want, I don't want to rant too much. <laughs> and, and to add to that, to add to that, you know, that's actually one of the biggest issues with some, you know, disclaimer statement. I am not Tate Dooley. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah so that's one of the biggest debates with some of these gmo foods is because they are treated with higher levels of a glyphosate 2,4-d all these other chemicals but also higher levels of bt <laughs> higher levels of bacillus thuringiensis that that's one of the arguments of why GMO food can potentially be very bad for your gut biota is because it is very rich in BT and that BT actually accumulates in, in your gut over time. And that accumulation point is about 30 years old, they say. Once you reach about 30 years old, if you've been eating fast food and blah, 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 blah for your whole life, that you could have a BT accumulation and the BT accumulation will throw off your gut biota and will mess with how other bacteria populate in your gut, which obviously, as we all know, the newest area of science for human health is the gut brain, the gut biota connection, you know? So... There is some major validity into Kyle's tinfoil hat that I share and wear with him. <laughs> and there you have it. You never know what's going to come up or what you're going to what you're going to learn on. So there's your water. I have honestly never heard that. So thank you so much, Kyle. That is what our nerd sessions are completely all about. Is that yeah. everybody comes together, we find solutions, we learn things. Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate all of your knowledge, Kyle. Thank you. And you should check. You guys should all check out. We always we always endorse and recommend for people to look for this information outside of just us. Seek for it on your own. There's a lot of actually really fun infographical videos, even on YouTube, about BT and the human gut biota. And I'd highly recommend checking it out. Well, um, so, so, so back to, back and to as well as beneficial bugs. <laughs>
Sorry. Sorry. Did someone else uh, have a uh, just a quick question for Kara? How we were talking about the uh, beetles that I have going on in the garden right now. Lee beetle. So I'm on that level as well that I prefer not to spray anything in the garden. Um, but I was kind of looking at just planting for the future, doing uh, pyrethrium like daisies and stuff. So that way I could hopefully avoid that problem that I have in the future. Yes. And um, using beneficial nematodes, I sent, I think I sent you um, the life cycle. I sent you a screenshot of the life cycle. And that'll help you determine when you can use the beneficial nematodes to help combat them from pupating into adults. So that way you don't have adults. I don't know. I'll have to do some research on traps and lures. Um, off the top of my head, I don't think Arbico has any traps and lures for flea beetles, but a lot of the times people use traps and lures in the summertime when they're most um, active in their adult stage to prevent them from going back into the soil in the fall to uh, lay their eggs and overwinter and come back up in the spring in your particular space. So I'll have to do some research on that and I can definitely get back to you. But um, traps, yellow sticky traps are always gonna help monitor all of this movement and activity as well. So always something good to have in the garden as well. I wanted to remind everybody that uh, I put sure. the, the link um, in chat, which is uh, Kara's quick reference guide. Um, that's a really good resource. It's a PDF. So it's just a link to a PDF. You want to uh, click on that. And yes. um, it's a quick test reference guide. It's it's common for you know the top ten common insects, caterpillars, uh, aphids, butterflies, and it tells you you know some bullet points of what you can use. So um, I thought that would be really, really helpful for everybody in the chat to, to have access to that and to reference to it in the future if you're having any type of test problem. Cool. That's so amazing. Thank you for putting that together for us. Yeah, thank you, Kara. And uh, it's every time I'm, I'm becoming a bug person. <laughs> it's the best way to be, bro. It's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Just people think they're smarter than Mother Nature, and more often than not, Mother Nature will teach us very quickly that we are not. <laughs> well, well, and of course, Mother Nature will be here long after we're gone. Yeah. yeah. She's been doing it for a few billion years. I think she knows what she's doing at this yeah. point. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I got a question for Kara about uh, nematodes and veg. Yes. So if, I, if I'm using those in veg and then I flip to flower, and I introduce predator mice, are those nematodes going to attack those predator mice? No, not at all. No. Okay. Um, I have had clients, believe it or not, even though nematodes are essentially worms, I have actually had people use, in particular, the SF nematodes, which is Steiner Nema Feltier. They've used them as a foliar spray to combat russet mites. And yeah. they had 100% success. It was just mind blowing. This was a few years ago, like when I first started working at Arbico. And um, he would call me back and be like, they're working, they're still working, they are literally still working. And I was like, that's so awesome. Like, so um, they will work towards russet mites. Russet mites also drop to the soil to pupate um, and work their way back up onto the plant. So you can use them for rusted mite larva in the soil, you can also use the beneficial nematodes as a foliar spray. Um, but to my knowledge, they're not going to harm Swirsky, Andersonian, Californicus, Persimilis. They're not going to harm any of those types of beneficial mite predators. Well, and then, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. That, that's the best way to apply nematodes versus uh, just directly in the soil is to foliar them, or do you think direct in the soil is? No, when you apply nematodes, you definitely want to put them in the soil because they're worms. Yeah. Um, so, so they can't live on the plant, but if they come in contact with a russet mite on the plant, they can parasitize them. So realistically, you definitely want to keep them in the soil. 
<laughs> but for backup, let's say you're in flower and you have russet mites and you need to spray something, you can absolutely do a foliar spray of the nematodes while you're in flower. Ha! Ah, never heard yeah. of that. I've never heard of I that. I know. Good trip. That's crazy. See, I I'm learned something. That has to be three, though, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't see why not. You have, you know, beneficial mite predators on your, on your flowering right. plants, and you're not really going to test a negative when you're testing your bud for... For bugs unless there's like an absurd amount of like an infested cola of spider mites obviously there's a certain percentage per state whatever but um i i you're not gonna have a problem oh interesting uh, woody i think woody is eli right is it, I think yes so, yeah. yes so yes that's woody is eli so hey he's asking when would you recommend applying the other outside fall or spring or your opinion on putting them into compost soil yeah, so I I mean, the sooner you get them into the soil, the better off they're going to be for you. Obviously, your soil temps play a role in the viability of nematodes. Um, as long as your soil temps are not freezing, you can apply beneficial nematodes. Um, and in the preventative world of using pests or using predators, you always want to start before, before anything. And I do recommend using nematodes pre-planting and even going into winter, applying nematodes to combat anything that's going to overwinter for the following year. Just make sure you do those applications afterwards. I would probably not use the SF nematodes as a foliar preventative treatment. I would say only if you need to do it, if they're currently present on your plants, you would be better off using a mite predator to establish prior, they're just gonna sustain on the plant a little bit better. It's more so of like, if you have an emergency with russet mite infestations and you need to spray something, you can spray the SF nematodes. And then in the so compost I, period, well, you're, 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 good with, you're good with putting them in compost and letting them kind of do their thing in compost to help knock down everything as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, how long do the nematodes last if I like store them? So our nematodes, you can store them in this package unopened up to two weeks. If you break the seal on this package, you, you do need to use them that day because there's a certain amount of moisture in these packages. Um, and once they dry out, they die. So you really want to use them as soon as possible. I mean, this is probably one of the only ones that you can really store. Um, but we've done some crazy tests at Arbico. We had a a van outside that was 130 degrees for a week and we put these in that van and we looked under a microscope and uh they're viable they're extremely resilient to to weather um so it, it really doesn't matter they they do score very well but for the best optimum viability you want to try to get them into the soil as soon as possible especially to break the seal okay well so a couple things with that like what if what if you're breaking the seal and then say like, cause I did that and then um, I put them into a Tupperware uh, and put them back in the fridge. Yeah, so we we don't recommend that to to keep as the best viability possible. If you ask me outside of, of Arbico, um, they are, usually pretty freaking viable. Um, there are certain strains like the um, like the SF and the SC nematodes that you can store for a little bit longer. We typically have uh, viability issues with, in particular, the HB is with their longevity. Um, and it's just the species, they, they sometimes require a little bit more humidity. Um, I would say, personally, if I were to use them, I probably wouldn't store them because I'd want to use them you know, to their best of their capabilities. So I want to use them as soon as possible. I don't recommend storing them for over a week. If you did break the seal on, on the package. I've never seen them in uh, the powder. I've only ever gotten them on sponges. Yeah, so we have a few different, we have a few different, um, I've never seen the ones that come in the sponges, but we do have um, Rio Brave and we have an Indica strain that come in a gel. 
And so the nematodes are in a gel and you have to use like a, a strainer or like a, like a cheesecloth and you have to strain the nematodes out of the, of the gel. And so you extract them from the gel and then you apply them into water. Um, so I, those are the only three ways that I've um, heard of nematodes being stored. I've heard, the, I've heard this question come up as well, Kara. Um, I, and I, I, I believe we were talking with um, Zach with uh, um, uh, our, our IPM guy, yes. Um, and uh, we talked about, you know, if you're going to send them in a liquid solution through something that contains pressure, there's a limit at which the amount of pressure that you can use that it won't actually physically kill the nematode itself, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That is and correct. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Um, he said 200 there was, PSI. Yeah, 200 PSI. I have heard 300 PSI. So I would say as long as you're in, within that range, you're probably okay. Um, another thing with beneficial nematodes is the method that you are using to apply them. Um, you want to make sure you're not using a fine mist setting when you are applying these. A fine mist setting is too small of a pore that the nematodes cannot properly flow through. So if you're adding them into some type of uh, reservoir and you're using, um, you know, you want to make sure your nozzle is, we like to call it a shower head setting, which is yeah. porous enough for these to properly flow through. You, and they can't pump sometimes. Yeah, you need volume, volume, not pressure. I used to have a compost tea spray rig that I would put nematodes in, compost tea, and apply it. So it's more just a, I think a suction pump it was, and it just circulate that way and aerate it. So I keep it viable for 20 you know, I apply it for customers. I do have the landscaping and then deep roof feed it so forth. So you can't use high pressure spray rate like most products you can apply with. And as the mash it will, it will destroy your biology 100%. So it's all about application, how you do it, even compass too. Yes, and another point to add to that, um, if you have tanks that are aerated, your nematodes are going to last longer in water, um, but they're not aquatics, you know, they're not a fish, so you really need to get them into the soil as soon as possible, unless you have a really good aerated tank that they're being circulated through, then they're going to last longer. How long would you recommend them? Let's say that they're sitting in a cyclone T-brewer. What would your what would your preferred or and your maximum life be in a tea brewer? That's a super good question, and we should test that on one of your brewers in particular because your brewers are special, anyways, and they make microbial life last longer in general. So I would be really really curious to see how long you could retain viability with nematodes in your types of brewers. Send me like 10 pounds of each type of nematode and I'll figure it out for us. I have a sweet microscope. I would be so interested in figuring out how long that would last because in a traditional brewer, I would say no longer than 12 hours. And again, it's just, they're not fish, you know, but if they have more air, then they're going to last longer. So that would be a really fun experiment. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, did, I did brew it with a tea. I'm curious. Uh, and, uh, but, but, and so, and so for both of you, Taylor and Kara, so would you recommend the best way if you're putting it into a tea brewer is really just long enough to get them dispersed and mixed into the water and then drain them? Okay. Makes sense. Yes. I'm doing it tomorrow morning. Same thing. Yeah, it works that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm adding, I got a tri my triple nematode pack that I didn't get to use this last week. And traditionally, I always hand water in my nematodes. I'm going to I'm gonna throw them through my system this time and see how they do. So one recommendation when you do that, pre-mix your nematodes in a water solution and make sure there are no clumps. Because like you can see with these nematodes, you see how there's clumps in there? Yeah. So sometimes those do not break apart. You can use your fingers. I always used to literally open this pack when, when it's dry and I break them up with my fingers. You want to make sure that they just dissolve really well because the clumps 
which is just the nematodes coming together for warmth. They've been sitting in a refrigerator, you know? So um, you want to make sure that those are completely broken up. And that is typically the common problem with clogging is that those clumps do not get dissolved properly. So you can use a little bit of water, make sure they dissolve really well, put them in your tanks and you can run them through irrigation. It typically is okay. And but as long as your irrigation is important right. enough that they can flow through too, that's really important. Well, one Is thing with why aren't they clogging the emitters in the street? I'm not sure. I'm not worried about my emitters. I'm more worried about my inline screens yeah, that go yeah, from you my know, tanks. You get, of, you get a lot of inline screens with one big ass pump. Huge yeah. pump. Huge two horsepower yeah. pump. What? I've done it that way before. I've done it that way before. But those Mondies are because they, they're straight impeller pumps. They definitely do beat up the biology a little bit. The Mondi pump, the impeller pumps. But um, so, well, like a couple things, Tate, with your big tea brewer, like, is that too much pressure? when they're getting mixed around with how big your pump is, it's well, there's air pressure. It's only in, air. In the tea brewer. Your when, your, it goes, your when it goes through the, when it goes through the actual irrigation system, then it goes After my the tea brewer. brewer. After the tea brewer, right. Okay. It goes so tea brewer, pump, filter, that. irrigation plants. Gotcha. So also, Kara, how you were saying that they're clumping together um if i were because i i didn't use all of mine but if i were to look at them since they're in the fridge and they're still clumped together is that a good sign it's not a bad sign they just do that to re to generate heat that's really all that that really means and obviously the medium that they're mixed with um usually the the signs of bad nematodes are that they smell rancid but we have tested nematodes that smell that bad and they still are thriving. So they're just, they're exceptional. They're really an exceptional organism. And that's what I'm saying. Like we can't, in order to keep our customers happy with like, oh yeah, they're viable, don't storm for three months, you know, because we, uh, we, <laughs> it's we, best practice. Like, yeah, yes, like, well, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, so because like I didn't use all of them, and like a lot of a lot of what I'm using these things for is yes, cannabis, but also my veggies and my lawn and all that stuff. Like I had people come by my house this year, and they're like, "Oh, can we spray the perimeter of your property for you know to keep bugs away?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'm I'm not doing that this year. I." went ahead and went with the nematodes and like I put them in right after I aerated my lawn and tilled my garden. So like I applied them then, but I also still had a shit ton left that I was like, okay, if I just keep them in the fridge in a cool environment, then maybe I can do it when I aerate in the fall. And like, they're still clumpy. Like I know that I looked at them last night because I knew this call was going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, so, so um, the best, uh, so if you have, I think you can look at like, even if you have a 60X microscope, let's say you get like a little Petri dish and you put a little water in there with a smidge of nematodes and you get like a 60X microscope and let them sit for 15, 20 minutes, see what happens. I've seen them in a 60X, so obviously you're going to see them a lot better with like a hundred X, which is what we use here uh, for our quality control at Arbico. But um, I would not be surprised if they're still good. I really wouldn't. And, and they're just very resilient. They're an amazing organism. I, I, I would say they're probably going to be fine. Um, but again, our, we just tell people two weeks, but I, I'm a firm believer in the nematodes and, and they, they're viable for much longer than what we recommend. And just for anybody who's yeah, ever been under, under a microscope and look for that type of stuff, movement is viability. So it's, 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 if they're moving around, if they're doing their thing, that means they're viable. If they're literally just sitting there not moving at all, that means that they're they're not viable. And you know, not once once again, it's not best practice, but I bought some nematodes at the end of last year, got distracted, didn't get to use them at the end of the year last year. I just used them last week. 
I saw a response. So we're talking nine months, 10, 12 months type of shit. <laughs> not best practice, not recommended. Oh, they're coming with us to the moon. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll take a look at those and let you know. And also, um, yeah, as far as like putting them in the uh, compost soil, like it was, it was kind of everything all at once. So I did the lawn, the garden, and then my compost before I started to let it cook. Cool. That's perfect. So probably my favorite thing. Yeah, and you What's can that? Never, you can never over apply nematodes ever. Like I. I you could just waste tea. money, kind of. <laughs> you can't want to buy tea here, so. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Just spray it everywhere. Seriously. Everywhere. <laughs> Foliage, <laughs> keep root feed it, you know, just let it go. Yeah. 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 Do. <laughs> Make a nice bubble bath with your leftovers. <laughs> I well there's what we could do when I used to have uh, the leftover giant 55 gallon drums of hash water from making bubble hash we would take bubble hash baths and I'll put <laughs> nematodes in there too let's throw this subject for another another bug nerd's call yes we'll do that another day <laughs> Well, we really appreciate you guys hanging out with us. And any last questions? Right. You know, I think here's the thing. I think we're going to need to do Bug Nerds again with our first one. Well, we're actually starting a competition to be determined. Uh, details coming soon. We're starting a competition or a, a giveaway. Excuse me. It's a giveaway. And during this giveaway, we're going to be actually marketing and pushing these uh these nerd sessions a heck of a lot harder and we're going to be doing all sorts of fun things and so during that time we're going to definitely be having arbico back on during that so it's gonna be good do it yes so thanks everybody this is a great one thanks everybody for your participation for coming out you know i, I i'm liking that we're getting some regulars you know, so we're just going to keep doing this. So I, uh, I did have that. one last, last question um, as far as Kara. Okay. So you're saying they're not aquatic, um, but also putting them into a compost tea. If I'm doing like a 12 to 24 hour thing, how's that going to affect them? Yeah, you want to put them in right before you're, you apply your tea. OK, gotcha. Cool. All right. Yeah, let them let them put them in. Let them mix. Ten minutes, a half hour, an hour. Boom! Apply them. Gotcha. All right, Kyle. Be ready for my questions later. <laughs> you know I got you, brother. You know I got yes, you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, I gotta get going, but just chatting with everyone. See you on the Thanks, Kara. Later. Well done. Yep. Thanks, Kara. Thanks, thanks, Kara. Awesome. Hey, thank you very much, Kara. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. Until next time. Thank you. Until next time. Later. Thanks, everybody. Mom. Mom! 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 Come here! I see baby snakes roaming around. Mom! Mom!
Mom! I'm going to open them. Three, two, one. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking one more day. Speaking of, did you get the heat pads turned on? No. Huh? No, because I didn't want it heating with nothing in there. You need to get the heat pads turned on and get some some bedding in there. Well, they just get paper towels at first. I know. You want it to be the same temperature, Mom. It's the paper towel. All right, so which one's which? Is the stop? I just have to. You know how much it
because they're not going to have like thick bedding. Should I put their heat mat on like 95? The other ones are on 97, but they've got the cocoa in there. What do you think? I'm going to do Like dinosaurs. We should mark down on the calendar, on the data sheet, all of them are out except for like three. Did we mark on there when they pit? Yeah. And when they cut them? Did we yeah. mark on their cutting? Day? Yes. Yes. Here's the other. I fell asleep. Bow, ow.
Bow, ow. Bow, ow. Bow, ow. No, Lydia. It's in the storage room. What it did, 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 Messing with the lid. You stop messing with the. No, you stop. What time is it? It's three fifty-six. Lydia, stop messing with my keyboard. Stop. Shh. Yeah. I'm gonna go home without new paper. Oh! Oh! oh. We're gonna go to bed. Mommy! Are you up to. Oh, it's already up to 90. 91. What? <sighs> Who's even cheating? I don't know. I wanted to go get a pellet gun. Just worried about if he has moving targets where it's going and what it's hitting. You know what I mean? Where you're gonna hit. Okay, you don't need one that's gonna get the police called if somebody sees you holding it. I advise again something that looks like that. <laughs> okay? Something discreet. Okay. Discreet.
Mijida McLidida McIjida McLidida Lidida McIjida Lidida McIjida da da Really excited to share this with you. It's something we've not really done in a while. Let's talk about a specific marker for a heterozygous. Hey, mom. There's one that is actually very, very quite reliable. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Who's that? Mama? She said something changing her. Can I see her? So the one marker that's very reliable in ball pythons is head of pythons. Maybe that's why she did that. You can look for it on your head pythons and your cross head pythons. It's a really good indicator that it's a carrier of the pythons gene, even though it doesn't show it. So it's basically two different kinds of head pythons. There's the ringer, which is when it shows a kind of like a white spot on the lower third of the body, a big white spot kind of climbing the back of the snake from the sides. And then there's another kind, which is called train tracks or train tracks along the bottom of the snake, which are black lines that run along the sides of the tail. And they're very, very bold. No, so let's go look at those in person and talk about yeah, how reliable those markers are. So we're going to start with a couple of normal looking snakes. Is she a girl? No, I thought they might be taking over too. I didn't. So, this is a Morphs 101. So, we're really excited to share this with you. It's something we've not really done in a while. I'm just talking about a specific marker for a heterozygous animal. So, there's one that is actually very, very quite reliable. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today and、uh, see what you can learn. So, the one marker that's very reliable in ball pythons is het pies markers. So, it's a certain thing that you can look for on your het pies and your pos het pies that's a really good indicator that it's a carrier of the pi gene, even though it doesn't show it. So, there's basically two different kinds of het pie marker. There's the ringer, which is when it shows a kind of like a white spot on the lower third of the body, a big white spot kind of climbing the back of the snake from the sides. And then there's another kind, which is called train tracks or train tracks along the bottom of the snake, which are black lines that run along the sides of the tail, and they're very, very bold. So let's go look at those in person and talk about how reliable those markers are. So we're going to start with a couple of normal looking snakes, and these are actually both head pies. This one has a relatively normal belly, okay? You see, it has just some kind of standard checkering on the belly, which is quite normal for a normal, but it has. A little bit of black you know, markings here on the sides of the belly towards the tail. And that's going to be on the outside of the main kind of center, you can see the white scales in the belly. These black markings, that's really, really, really kind of subtle het pie markers. Now she is 100% het pie, so that shows you that they don't all have really strong markers. But now we're going to show you another one that has really strong markers. This is exactly what we look for when we're looking for. Het pie markers on a snake. And this girl is a big double het clown pie. But you see on her, she has really, really strong, kind of up here, it's kind of typical belly, but when it gets towards the tail, has really strong black, almost like someone took a sharpie down both sides. Something fast. And in、so、my experience, when you have a possible het pie and it has these markers, it's almost guaranteed that it's going to prove to be het pie. And so it's one of those things if you're holding back animals and looking for something to hold back, you're going to want to do one with those markers. So the interesting thing comes when you're looking at how some of these other genes, when you put like pastel and yellow belly and fire and algerian, how those markers translate at that point. So we're going to go look at some of those now and see how those look. So the next one we're going to look at, we're going to look at a couple black heads, one of which is not head pie. This one's not head pie. The very typical belly has a little bit of markings down here, but it's not very strong. You know, what we look for is this kind of markings really, really strongly all the way up the tail as a good head pie marker. So, this is a black head that is not head pie, and now we're going to show you one that is and what a really strong head pie marker looks like. Okay, so here is an excellent example of some of the stronger levels of head pie markers. You see, it has the black line running all the way up, almost to halfway up the snake or even higher. 
It's got a little bit of what we call a ringer here, which we'll talk a little bit more about that, where the white starts to come up a little bit up the side of the snake from the tail. And so this is a girl that is 100% head pie and it's black head as well. A beautiful, beautiful female and a great example of head pie markers. I'm just gonna keep throwing a few examples at you guys here so you can see the repetition, see some of the variations. This is a mahogany double head monarch pie, but again, really strong markers. A little bit of a ringer coming up here, the white's trying to come up the side of the snake, on both sides, and really, really strong black markings all the way down. Here's a little bit of variation. This is actually a super orange dream clown head pie. I want you to see what the belly is doing here. We have the same sort of thing going on where instead of having the big black markers, what you end up having is this really, really light line. But see how far it's coming up the side of the snake? It's on both sides. That's a sign that's going to prove 100% hip high. Of course, it already is. We know that. But that's a good way to learn markers is to actually have 100% heads and see how they differ from ones that aren't heads and to see what the variation is. So now we're looking at some babies and look at it on a small scale, because most people, when they hatch these, they're going to be looking at the tails of babies. So let's check this out. This one is perfectly, has a perfectly normal belly, completely standard, and then extremely variable the bellies on these. The entire, any normal is extremely variable. But just to kind of give you a baseline if you're looking at, you're looking at just kind of speckling, kind of random pattern. Um, the alien heads on the side continue to go all the way down to the tail, very, very standard. Nothing particularly different about that. So let's take this one and compare it to one that is head pie. So here's a comparative one. This is an orange dream. And again, you see the difference there between the bellies. This has a very, very clear belly and then lots of black tracks all the way down the edge on both sides. It's a really, really strong head pie marker. Now, orange dreams can be difficult because orange dreams a lot of times will have a certain amount of this anyways, but when you add head pie, it makes it even stronger. Here's another example in a desert ghost. And this snake is deep and shed, but this is fire and orange dream, and desert ghost, and head pie that wants to bite me. Look at the belly on this. Look at how clear that is, and then you have really, really, really strong black markings all the way down. Kind of, when you have fire and orange dream, they kind of combine together with the head pie markers to give you these really, really crazy tracks. And it's not just on the belly, actually. What happens is, because the belly has these black markings, it actually has a elongated pattern here towards the tail too. So sometimes you can actually look at the top of the snake and say, well, if it has really, really, really long, elongated pattern towards the tail, the bottom of that pattern will have the black edging. So you can kind of see head pie markers without even, even looking at the belly because it's really, really strong effect like this. Here's two more. Um, I'm showing you the different variations so that you can recognize it in different combos. So this, Markings down here, but it's not very strong. You know, what we look for is uh, this kind of marking is really, really strongly all the way up the tail of a good head pied marker. So this is a black head that is not head pied, and now we're going to show you one that is, and this is what a really strong head pied marker looks like. Okay, so here is an excellent example of some of the stronger levels of head pied markers. You see, it has the black line running all the way up, almost to halfway up the snake, or even higher. It's got a little bit of what we call a ringer here, which we'll talk a little bit more about that, where the white starts to come up a little bit up the side of the snake from the tail. And so this is a girl that is 100% head pie and it's black head as well. A beautiful, beautiful female and a great example of head pie markers. I'm just gonna keep throwing a few examples at you guys here so you can see the repetition, see some of the variations. This is a mahogany double head monarch pie, but again, really strong markers. A little bit of a ringer coming up here the white's trying to come up the side of the snake on both sides and really, really strong black markings all the way down. Here's a little bit of variation. This is actually a super orange dream clown head pie. I want you to see what the belly is doing here. We have the same sort of thing going on where instead of having the big black markers, what you end up having is this really, really light 
line, but see how far it's coming up the side of the snake? It's on both sides. That's a sign that's going to prove 100% hep I. Of course, it already is. We know that. But that's a good way to learn markers is to actually have 100% hets and see how they differ from ones that aren't hets and to see what the variation is. So now we're looking at some babies and look at it on a small scale because most people, when they hatch these, they're going to be looking at the tails of babies. So let's check this out. This one is perfectly, has a perfectly normal belly, completely standard, and then extremely variable the bellies on these. The entire, any normal is extremely variable. They just kind of give you a baseline that you're looking at. You're looking at just kind of speckling, kind of random pattern. Um, the alien heads on the side continue to go all the way down to the tail, very, very standard. Nothing too really different about that. So let's take this one and compare it to one that is hep hive. So here's a comparative one. This is an orange dream. And again, you see the difference there between the belly. This has a very, very clear belly and then lots of black tracks all the way down the edge on both sides. It's a really, really strong hep hive marker. Now, orange dreams can be difficult because orange dreams a lot of times will have a certain amount of this anyways, but when you add hep hive, it makes it even stronger. Here's another example in a desert ghost. And this snake is deep and shed, but this is fire and orange dream, and desert ghost, and hip pie, and once you Look at the belly on this. Look at how clear that is, and then you have really, really, really strong black markings all the way down. Kind of, when you have fire and orange dream, they kind of combine together with the head pie markers to give you these really, really crazy tracks. And it's not just on the belly, actually. What happens is, because the belly has these black markings, it actually has an elongated pattern here towards the tail, too. So sometimes you can actually look at the top of the snake and say, well, if it has a really, really, really long, elongated pattern towards the tail, the bottom of that pattern will have the black edging. So you can kind of see head pie markers without even, even looking at the bellies, and it's really, really strong effect like this. Here's two more. I'm um, showing you the different variations so that you can recognize it in different combos. So this, these are from the Xanthic Pie Clutch. This is the Hurricane OG Vanilla. Um, and check that out. It's 100% head pie, but look at the markers there. The big the black lines running down the sides, clear belly in between. And again, you get the elongated pattern here. Up here, it's very normal, and then you get the elongated pattern and the black edging. And then when you add the Super OG, YB, and she, um, Vanilla, look at the edging on that. So it's really coming at this point, pretty far up the side, and if you see the edging is sitting on the belly, it's actually on the side of the snake all the way down, it's bright orange. Look at that, really, really, really cool. It's the beginning of a little ringer there, a little white speck trying to come up the side there. Ringer, again, is the other another indicator of head pie. And ringer is basically an extreme form of the head pie marker. It's a whole visual. So those are some examples of head pie markers. The other one is a ringer, but a ringer, although they're very, very visual and very, very cool, is only a really an extension of a head pie marker. All it is is a head pie marker kind of coming up the side a little bit and creating a white wrap. And it's always in that last third of the snake. Anything higher than that really is not considered um, part of it, that head pie thing. We've had some ringers that are high up the snake. It's not been part of the same thing. But when they have a ringer, it's just an extra indication of really, really strong markers, an extra indication that it is head pie, and they're super cool when you see them. All right, so those are some examples of what head pipe markers look like. But honestly, there's some big questions that are out there that I get these questions all the time. And the first one is, if your snake has head pipe markers and it's not possible head pipe, what are the chances that it's going to be head pipe? And I did a little experiment when I first got into this. I bought a bunch of adult females from different sources when I was first getting into this industry. It's been almost 20 years since I've done this, but we got about a total of 10 that had really strong head pie markers. And I saw them, I was like, wow, those are just as strong as you could possibly get. I bred all 10 of those to a pied male, didn't get a single pie. So we, we know from that is that head pie markers, that look can occur very naturally among normals. So if you're seeing them and, you're, and your snake is not pos head pie, it really has very little significance. Now in pos head pie, this is like actually came from a visual or from a head pie, so you do pos head pies, and you see those markers. In my experience, you have a very, very, very strong chance, like 90% plus. I've never had one that came, was a pos head pie with markers that did not prove. However, there is also a pretty significant percentage of 100% head pies without markers. So if you get pos heads without ringers, 
it doesn't mean that they're not het pied. So basically, in a nutshell, het pied markers on possible het pied animals are very reliable, but the absence of them is not a proof that they're not. When I'm holding back animals personally, I'm holding back to plums with het pied markers, knowing that some of the ones I let go still have a possible chance. And if it's a really nice animal, sometimes even without markers, I'll give it a shot. But it's something that you can definitely use. It's, I would say, probably 100% het pieds, probably 75% plus of them have pretty strong markers. So it's a really, really good, reliable thing for you to look at in your collection when you're working with pieds and make more of them in the future. So thanks for watching, guys. I hope that helps. And this has been a new Morphs 101. We're trying to do more of these and just keep introducing you guys to different ways of identifying these snakes. It's really pretty complicated now. When I first got into like five mutations in all ball pythons, and I get to learn them a little bit every year, well, I can't imagine coming into it the learning curve that so many people. Mom, what are we doing about TN? Mom, Mom, Mom. Mom, do you want me to go get tea again? Okay. Where's his Taekwondo stuff? Where's his Taekwondo stuff?
Yeah.
<laughs> All right, everybody, we're going to end the live stream. Thanks for letting us know.